when I came back to Hong Kong, the first person I actually worked for was uh, Alvin Leung from Bonovation. It was a time where in Spain, you could see the move, the Spanish movement with Ferran Adria and the whole molecular gastronomy. And at that point, to be that international in Hong Kong and be executing modern Chinese food and having stories, he was the first one. And, and, and it was mind blowing to see at that time, the potential of food. And I could really see, wow, like people were really interested and people knew him from Anthony Bourdain. So every time I, I arrived at a location and I told them I worked for Alvin, they would say, oh my God, is he the demon chef with the cigar in Anthony Bourdain? And it was, it was crazy how small the world was and how people connected to a, to a person through shows or, you know. And so I think that that was really what opened my mind about the, the different possibilities in food that was beyond just dining. I think there was multiple movements happening at the same time. Obviously, the world was globalizing at the same time was localizing. So it was local for international. And so I think the understanding of Chinese food for the Western world is very still 10% of what Chinese culinary offers. And if you look at Chinese culinary, because of communism, because we closed the doors to the world, we're actually 15 years behind and we stopped developing as a cuisine. And so in Hong Kong was the, is the most global city in, in China. So the access point at that point, like chefs were you know, eating abroad, uh, uh, the influence was coming from Spain, but it felt almost like it was next door, close to home. Like you had all this information online through through books and 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 then TV shows came along, and so to have an influence like Michelin Guide that was going international, and then followed by you know people like Anthony Bourdain, followed by you know World's Fifty Best, Asia's Fifty Best, it made the world seem very small, and so it was directly influencing the type of cuisine that was happening in Hong Kong, and before that, I don't think we were in a position where everything Western was better. And so with economic power and the development of China and, and the past 15 years of what they've done, it's also made the community more proud in a way to be Chinese because suddenly it's cool. Like you see celebrity, Chinese celebrities in Hollywood films. And so suddenly it's cooler to do Chinese food than to do Western food. But that was not the case 10, 15 years ago. For example, Jose Andre is amazing because he reflects, you know, the whole issue about treatment of immigrants and how people want to be now, instead of being global, they want to localize and like put up walls and have their own identity. They've like kind of like fed up about this whole idea of globalization. They want their own things and they want to be their own, you know, nationality or things like that. And so I think when you see someone like that, that's like, you know, not just cooking, but reflecting his place you kind of try to identify what does that mean for me? Like I joke sometimes with people, they ask me, is this chicken free range? And I tell them in Hong Kong, you know that people still live in cages and we have a huge housing issue. So before we free the chicken, which is great in the US because I was like, you passed the, you know, you passed, you know, you already passed the finishing line and you have, you know, like different issues, first world problems to solve. We still kind of like have, kind of basic issues that we haven't resolved. And we have to look at, you know, our basic human rights or like the freedom to vote or so become, then I cannot just be like, oh, you know, I'm super into the same issues that he's into because those are not my local community issues. My local community issues is like helping, you know, the the, um, the gap in pay or, or, or housing or how do we reflect those things? And, and what's my role in trying to, uh, 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 not just present food, but present culture in, in a dining experience that's not just on the plate, but having conversations with people because they're coming to Hong Kong to travel and, and they don't just want to eat food, they want to learn more about the people. And I think that you know people are more interested in in-depth knowledge than just kind of having something tasty and, and, and that's not enough anymore. And so what I'm trying to tell is, is like, Creativity is actually not free. It depends on 
you know, different places in the world. You can, you can probably be more creative in the U.S. compared to maybe being creative in China and how people perceive we have to not only fight the idea of what creativity is, but we have to fight the value of the food. Like, how can I convince you, although I use as much as good ingredients to do this rice noodle, but why does it always have to be priced cheaper than pasta? And I love those conversations. Today in 2019, people actually, I cannot even say that, you know, I'm 10 years ago to be gay, to be a woman, to be a chef, is like the lowest of low in society. But somehow today in a point of time, somehow I'm celebrated for all these things. And I didn't choose. Maybe if it wasn't as open today and it didn't benefit me, maybe I would be in the closet. Maybe I wouldn't be a chef. Maybe I married and, you know, secretly a gay person and trying to hide my Asian-ness by not eating, you know, Chinese food in front of my friends. It's so interesting how social media and like different things have put us on a pedestal that is somewhat disconnected to what we're actually doing sometimes. But because we are put on this pedestal and that we, people are interested in this voice, I think people don't want to waste that voice and just, because it seems like if I use this for, for just food and for myself and to get more famous for the sake of being more famous, I think a lot of chefs want to do a bit more.